named Susanna Simonis. Susanna was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She is the third generation of a spiritist family. She is a doctor of physical therapy and works as an assistant professor at Nova Southeastern University. Susanna is one of the founders of the Conscious, Conscious Living Spiritist Group in North Miami. She is currently president of the Spiritist Federation of Florida and is an active speaker in the Spiritist Movement in the, in the United States. Thank you. Um, I have some material yes. for you that um, Mommy Sue is um, giving out, right? If you were a couple um, going back to the same home, please take one. Um, I brought 22 copies and hopefully we'll have for everybody. If you, um, if someone doesn't get one at the very end, um, we can email you the material, which is over there, so you can, it's working out, right? Okay, it's good. So, Mauricio, I have one for you here, particularly for you. It's the only color copy that I have to my president. Come on. And mine is color too. All right. So, um, This material I put together actually um, with the purpose of um, using it in the future um, and for you to, to go back to your spiritual centers and use it um, for workshops that are um, supposedly uh, greater than an hour and a half. Quite honestly, I'm not sure how this is going to run in this hour and a half. I um, have look over it and try to think how am I going to do this and then finally said well I'll just ask the good spirits to tell me exactly what I should say and what I should emphasize and that's how it's going to be. So but um, because I know that I'm not going to be able to cover the entire material I will tell you what's in here first and then we're going to go over the material okay. So um, when you um, I'm not going to be able to hold this and hold this and run that thing at the same time. Um, thank you. So if we go to the first page, you're going to see the table of content. Um, so there will be some initial wor words. Um, I'm going to read them in an introductory message. The initial words are the only part in this entire work that you will find my own words. And they speak about um, you know, what my thoughts were and pretty much set up the tone for uh, the workshop. The introductory message is meant to, it's a warm up. So it's meant to, you know, if you're doing this back at your spiritual center, get people started to think, right? Um, about um, the obsession with the spirits movement, about uh, the difficulties that we find uh, in the spirits movement, that by the way, are difficulties that uh, we find in any groups, in any group where you're dealing with human beings, there are relational difficulties. And so the introductory message is meant to, um, again, um, get people started. Then, um, if you're doing this workshop at your spiritual center and um, you have a very heterogeneous group with you, some people with a lot more knowledge than others, you might want to review some basic knowledge about uh, mediumship so people can understand. A lot of stuff was spoken here today during our day. Um, the lecture by uh, Daniel uh, in the morning, right, when he spoke about thought and some important concepts. So I'm not going to go over this today. So if you were like really, really new to spiritism, you may be a little lost. But um, the way I did it, I actually put five questions there. And um, so for each of these parts, there's also activities, okay? So there is, um, I propose some activities. So for the basic knowledge part, there'll be five questions and you can try to answer them. And there'll be the answers at the end and also the references. 
of where you can find those answers. Um, basically, they are from the book Mechanisms of uh, Mediumship. Then, um, in part one, uh, we're going to talk about obsession, and this part covers some basic um, definitions uh, about obsession. And for today, we're going to just pass by them uh, very quickly. So we can hopefully focus on part two and part three. Um, so my main focus today is going to be on the initial words, the introductory message, and part two and part three. Okay. Um, so that's the plan, and now we can get started. All right, so before I even start with the initial words, I asked uh, Tanya if it was possible to change the arrangement of the room. I did not want to stand up. I think this is a topic that we must speak horizontally in the same level. And so I found very important not to be standing because Every single word that I am going to speak today very much and especially and primarily applies to myself. So um, I am very much part of the problem. And by the way, even before we start, um, let's take an honest um, evaluation of the floor. Who here thinks that Obsession is a problem in the spiritist movement. Please honestly raise your hand. Okay. Now, is every single person in this room a worker of a spiritist center? The majority of us are, right? I know my friend Kevin Kahn, who is in the, his first spiritist conference ever, is not. But besides him, I think everybody else pretty much is. Okay. So we all agree that we have a problem. So what I want to invite you today is to be part of the solution. So we come here, the first thing that I'm going to ask you is to believe that there is a solution. Is to believe that it's truly possible to solve this problem if we, um, if we open ourselves to this possibility. We are going to see through this work that one of the main, main sources of attack of the spirits, one of the main reasons and ways in which they do it, is they try to throw ourselves against one another. And if we all believe that um, there is a problem in the movement, I am afraid to say that the inferior spirits are finding a lot of room to influence us. And so, if you're here today, I want to believe that you are willing to work together. So, because you know what? Despite of our differences and our difficulties, and it all is central to the issue of relationship, um, I truly believe that each one of us go to our spiritual center and participate in the spiritual movement with the same intent, which is to serve Jesus. And so, if we have the same intent, we must, we must be able to sit together and even if, I was thinking um, these days, I had this idea in my mind, you know, put a piece of paper and ask two people to come here and draw um, two different um, boys. And let's see which boy looks prettier. Or we can say, okay, uh, Joe, can you please, you're really good in drawing like nice, beautiful faces, come and do that. <laughs> and then, you know, um, someone is very skilled in doing the hands, come and do that, right? Someone can do like very pretty legs, come and do that. And so each one of us has a talent. Each group has a talent, each group has something to offer. Each one of us has something very unique to bring to the movement, to the center, to today. So instead of competing to see who can do the best work, can we all work together, each one giving their best, so that at the very end, no, none of us really compromises the work that we are trying to do. And so this is the central idea that I'm going to try to convey here today. But there is a, a, something very important that we need to talk about. So let's go to the initial words, right? 
So today we are going to address the topic of obsession. Is anyone without this? Um, I'm so sorry. So um, can you um, share, please? Thank you. As my son says, my mind share is scaring. So it's, I would talk about my kids all the time because they're in my mind all the time. All right. So um, today we are going to address the topic of obsession in the spirits movement. Now. Stop reading. Think about, when we talk about obsession in the spirits movement, please don't say it out loud and try not to think too loud too. <laughs> Do you know of anyone in the spirits movement for a fact that you think is obsessed? Don't say it. <laughs> okay. Now, you can certainly think of a short list of names of people who you know for a fact they're obsessed. Well, this cannot be the starting point of our work, okay? Please take a minute and think about times in the last month in the spiritual center movement where you felt annoyed, hurt, not heard, disrespected, ashamed, devalued, irritated, angry, jealous, envious, or where you found yourself fighting, disputing, criticizing, speaking negatively about someone to someone else, or maybe gossiping. If you can identify at least one of the above situations, you are, like anyone else, vulnerable to obsession and to becoming a tool for the inferior spirits to bring disharmony to the spiritual center and movement. So please, we are all extremely vulnerable. All of us, all of us. I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone in the room. It's not my intent. And believe me, I myself have way, way more than one time some of those feelings where I was deeply irritated and, you know, I mean, we suffer from this um, ep epidemic um, problem of talking bad about the people that work with us. And we all do that. We all do that. And we do that a lot. We can't stop ourselves from speaking negatively about people, from criticizing people all the time. And the spirits will tell us that this is one of the biggest, biggest windows for the obsessive process. So as we leave here, and because I'm not sure how much, how much I'm going to be able to cover, I'm going to propose from the very beginning that as we leave here, let's make together, all of us, a huge effort to stop talking. That's the beginning. Stop talking. Because honestly, this goes against everything that we know in terms of love and charity, everything that we speak every day in our spiritual centers. And I know that this is a very, very big challenge because we are so used to talking bad about one another. So, um, all right, so this needs to be the starting point so that we can really uh, try to get as much as possible out of this hour and a half. So I continue saying that this realization might be disturbing and uncomfortable. You might find yourself fighting the idea that this could happen to you. Your ego refuses this possibility. This work will have more value if you're able to take a humble stance before we start. A humble stance recognizes human vulnerability. It recognizes that in our humanity, we seek to be seen to win, to be right and righteous, and to be adored. It is very disturbing to humans the idea that they do not hold the truth. This happens because for a long time we have been disconnected from the real source of all love, God, in and outside of us. So that's all it is. I mean, we need to understand that we are very, very vulnerable human beings. You, we have um, needs. Um, it's very, very disturbing for us the idea that we are not right. So, um, because if we're not right, what does that mean to us? You know, a lot of times we feel shame, we feel small, so um, we, we fight. We fight for the truth, our own truth. So, okay, 
At this point, you may be a little bit more inclined to admit that there's plenty in you that could become gaps for mental influence. Don't be ashamed. We are all together in this, and because we are together, there is hope for us. It is precisely through our choice to work together to engage in these activities that we have an amazing opportunity through the laboratory of human relationship to grow together, meaning over our own darkness, not our neighbor's darkness, our own darkness, right? So I think, I feel very um, hopeful. Um, I will be honest, not every day, not every minute, but I do feel right now sitting and looking at you because, um, you know, for the ones who have been into the spiritist movement more recently, it's been bumpy out there and it's been bumpy in here, and it's been bumpy everywhere, because we are bumpy people, you know? And so, but the fact that despite of all, you know, bumpy roads and, you know, accidents, we're here together sitting in this circle today, that gives me hope, you know? And I think my first message today is don't give up, don't give up. Let's keep trying because it is this is the work, you know. I always say this at the center. The work, the work that we invited to do is really not the lectures that we do, is really not the charity that we do. It's spiritism is for the leaders of the movement and for the workers of the movement. We are the ones who need the most and we need to stick to this no matter how hard it is because this is our chance. This is the lab for us. Dealing with one another is our best chance of enlightenment today. So if we decide for ourselves that I can't deal with Susanna anymore, I'm gonna work away from her, too bad. Because, um, you know, let's, can we sit together and try to talk one more time? Can we try to work it out? You know, we may not come to a full agreement of things, but let's see in what we can agree, okay? So isolation is not the answer. And, you know, again, the fact that we sit together is our best chance. It is my wish that through study, dialogue, goodwill, awareness, and love, that we'll be able to transition from a society that competes to one that cooperates. Cooperation calls for respect, for the ability to differ and still love, for the ability to place our viewpoint aside temporarily in order to embrace the higher viewpoint of not damaging the work. We have been raised to win. We draw our value from our ability to fight and win. However, to work with Christ or to make any relationship work, we must be able to yield and at times lose so all can win. So let me go back here and um, I think you, you see throughout this document that I have um, a lot of uh, sentences that are in bold. And it's just stuff that I like. And you can, you know, um, highlight anything else that you want. But I think one of the hardest things that um, challenges for us is when someone, let's say, um, you know, I don't know, Marcia, I'm going to pick you because I love you and I don't think I have any problems with you, so I can say this. All right, so let's say, Marcia and I, you know, um, we've been working to, together. She invites me to go sp speak in um, their uh, conferences. And then um, one day we differ deeply on one topic. And from that day on, I just don't like her as much anymore. I'm sorry. You know? And so the thing is, you know, can we, can we differ, can we have a different point of view and even if we cannot come to an agreement, but hey, all right, don't you want me to respect your point of view? Okay, so, and you respect mine too, and, and we respect the possibility that we can differ. But there's so much more that we have in common, oh, that we like to do together. So can we just continue to do those things together, even though you and I, you know, and you respect me and I respect you? Must we fight? <laughs> Must we turn our backs to one another? Must we give up on one another? That's a huge challenge. That's a huge challenge because a lot of times that's one major obstacle that we uh, see in the movement. Now, um, 
Let me talk about, I didn't vote this sentence, but, um, you know, uh, relationships, right? Um, if you're married, you know that for a marriage to last, um, you have to lose from time to time. You can't win all the time, right? And so, in the relationship, in the spiritual center, in the spiritual movement, it has to be the same way. You know, even if you think that you are absolutely right about something, we must do the exercise of losing. Without the ability to lose once in a while, we will never be cooperation. Because cooperation calls for an agreement. Cooperation calls for flexibility. Otherwise, we go back to hierarchical types of administrations when what I say is what it is. And the world of regeneration holds no place for this type of system anymore. We must learn to cooperate. We must learn to let it go. We must learn to, you know, sit in a table together. It's not about me deciding, it's about we deciding. It's to be able to listen to what the group has to say and take other points of view into consideration. So, final paragraph, if we focus on achieving these goals as individuals and as a group, letting the gospel speak loud in our hearts and actions, I am sure that despite occasional trips and falls, we will find as a group the strength to get up again and again, to forgive one another with empathy and love as many times as needed, closing all gaps to inferior influences and moving forward steadily and faithfully in the work entrusted to us by our Master. So those are my initial words and my sincere wishes for the spiritist movement in general. Now, I would like to um, ask um, a volunteer to please read the introductory message. And I have here initial activity, we're not gonna do this today, there is no time. But when you go back to your centers, you might wanna use this message. Um, the suggestion here is read and discuss the message with the group highlighting the main ideas found uh, in the text. So I don't speak all the time. Any volunteers? Anyone who would like to read it for us? Okay, wonderful. Um, you want me to speak really loud? Can everybody yes, hear please. Me? Uh, yes, speak I'm really loud and let me see if the microphone gets okay, over. Okay. It does. Sorry. Yeah. Do you want me to read all the way to the? Uh... Yes. <clears throat> to the end of the message. Okay. Uh, okay. Rivalries. Those who are imbued with the true principles of our doctrine regard all spiritists not as rivals, but as brothers and sisters. The Medium's Book, Chapter 31, Second Part, Item 22. Rivalry among spiritists is one of the main causes of the weakening of their doctrinal activities. Rivals, spirits, or at least contradictory. Rivals, spiritists, groups are opposing the interest of the doctrine. Superior spirits will not be present where this unit prevails. Vanity is a weed that spreads itself insidiously wherever the weed of unselfishness has not been cultivated. Under the pretext of being correct, no one has the right to offend anyone, for reason is always with he who is ready to understand and overcome dissension. No medium shall envy the mediumistic task of a fellow in ideals, thus depreciating his own task. When envy installs itself in someone's heart, then it is a sign that this person still has many limitations. Unenlightened spirits who plan to harm the spiritist doctrine concentrate their attacks on unwary mediums since they are an open door to shake the structure of the group. A medium must be discreet, talk less and serve more, thus giving an example of renunciation and love to the cause. The field of the Spiritist doctrine is immense. There is enough space for anyone who wishes to spread the good seed. Humanity is in need of spiritual nourishment. The objective of the disturbing spirits is that of deviating spiritists from their tasks. While arguing for nothing, their tasks will be delayed. What is the point of a medium working for the moral transformation of mankind if he 
or she does not contemplate modifying himself in the first place. A medium who works hard for the good of others, but is not concerned with his own renewal according to the principles of the gospel, is not doing the essential. The spiritual benefactors pity those who dedicate themselves to the external modification of the kingdom of God, but postpone indefinitely the inner construction of the sublime edification. No matter how numerous spirits groups may be, they should all be united under the light of the gospel. Mediums need to be more fraternal with one another. They should remember that even professional workers of the world, who usually work motivated by financial reasons, respect certain ethical rules. The spirit Fenelon on the Gospel according to Spiritism says, true spiritism has benevolence and charity as its maximum, and excludes any form of rivalry other than that of the good that can be done. The mediumship group that has no union will inevitably fail. In order to have true union, it is essential to have an exchange of favorable vibrations and fraternal thoughts. In the event of a problem appearing to threaten the balance of the group, it is advisable that the members of the group talk frankly, instead of making anonymous comments. The leader of a spiritist group needs to weigh his responsibilities and avoid falling into the traps of darkness. Let us remember that Jesus was responsible for the apostles and always kept them together despite their many differences. In Mark chapter 3 verse 24 and 25 we find the unforgettable master's lessons. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house be divided against itself, the house cannot stand. There is nothing that justifies the disunion among spiritist workers, just as, in our Christian view, nothing would have justified the disunion of those friends from our first hours of the gospel in the world. Let us fraternize in the ideal that unite us all, and let us go forward aware that we are still far away from the final victory of our doctrinal principles in the revival of Christianity. We are all mediums, chapter 27, Carlos Bacelli, Spirit Ojelon, Events. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm not going to comment on the message um, a whole lot, just um, very briefly um, highlight a couple things. Um, on the very beginning of the text, rivalry among spirits is one of the main causes of the weakening of their doctrinal activities. Um, and if you look at the very, um, in the middle, it talks about um, the objective of the disturbing spirits is uh, that of deviating spirits from their tasks. And at the very end, um, there is nothing that justifies the disunion among spiritist um, workers. So taking those sentences into consideration, I will say that the inferior spirits are gaining some room, you know. And so um, I think that one of the um, warnings for us is, are we contributing for that? Are we nurturing those feelings? Are we doing everything that we can to stop the flow of this harmony? Are we truly, truly doing our part? Or are we, with our words, with our thoughts and feelings, fomenting the disunion, fomenting? Because if we are still talking bad about one another, if we are closing our doors for dialogue, if we have given up on people and things, I don't know. I'm, I'm just putting out there uh, questions for us to, um, to think about. Um, what kind of feelings do we have in our hearts these days? We're going to talk a lot about feelings this afternoon. Because the feelings that we hold in our hearts 
in regards to our spiritual centers and movements and the people they are part of it speak a lot about how frail and vulnerable we are to the obsessive process. So I think that by the end of this afternoon we are going to be a little uncomfortable but the good thing is that we are in the same place. Nobody's going to be feeling like very different. And so um, it's good, it's good, it's all good. So let's move forward and again, um, you see there are uh, questions for basic knowledge. Um, you can go to page six. Yep, we um, have fun answering those. Can you go one more page seven? So let me show you how this looks. Choose the best and most complete answer. Now I'm like having fun of making questions for my students at uh, the university, so I was like, let me practice this. So let's see if you guys can get this. Uh, the human aura is A, the most external layer of the perispirit comprised of different densities and colors depending on the vibratory level of the person. B, don't answer until the very end. A tunic of electromagnetic forces containing the essences and the images that configure the souls in the most desires. C, the exteriorization of the electrical work produced by the physical cells. D, energy responsible for the sustentation of life in lower realms of life and for perception in higher beings. What do you guys think the answer is? Huh? B, A? Actually, um, let's go one by one. A, um, the most external layer of the pure spirit. It's not a layer of the pure spirit per se as much as the, the radiation of the pure spirit. Um, B is precisely the definition that Andrew Lewis gives in the uh, book Mechanics of Mediumship. Um, C is not wrong per se, but uh, the exteriorization of the electrical work produced by the physical cells is um, what composes the R, let's say, in plants, but in humans is, um, yes, is the work of the cells, but also the emission of our emotional uh, status, which B speaks to, okay? And D is, I don't even know what D is. So, anyway, um, I just wrote some sentence, some weird sentence, so. Anyway, so, and then if you go to page eight, you're going to see the supporting material, so you're going to find actually the, the, the um, paragraphs from the book Mechanics of Mediumship or uh, whatever source that I use for the answer. So when you go back to your groups, if you want to study that, you can go and hear uh, other resources, okay? Um, so we're going to move forward, and now we're in page nine which is understanding obsession. And again, these are very, uh, for most of us, these are very basic concepts, okay? So we start with the concept that we are all mediums. And um, I think everybody here understands that, um, that we all, as I like to say, are under the influence of the spirits, right? Um, on the next page, you have a definition of um, obsession. And um, so on the third paragraph, um, reads that obsession is the persistent action of, that, the, that the evil spirits exert upon a particular individual. And on the last paragraph there, on the definition of obsession, we learn that um, on the last sentence says that uh, there are uh, varieties for this phenomena, such as simple obsession, fascination, and subjugation. So, I'm, I chose to focus on fascination, I'll tell you why. Simple obsession, we all simply obsess. So, no point in talking about it. It's our day-to-day -day status. Um, I'm kidding, but not. Um, I'm kidding in the sense that, I really don't mean that we are like all obsessed this way. But, you know, we all go to phases in our lives where, you know, there is a little obsession going on, right? It's nothing major. But have you ever been stuck with like a really negative thought or, you know, a negative state of mind, you know? I mean, those moments are moments where, you know, you're probably under a little bit more of a negative, consistent influence of um, the spirit. So we kind of know this very well. And I want to say that none of us is close from the state of subjugation, hopefully. 
right? Which is the latest state of obsession where, you know, you're really, really losing control of your mind. So let's talk about fascination because fascination is something that we don't know so well and it's so, so subtle, it's so, so difficult to identify and is a very, very uh, big and dangerous problem. So that's where we're going to focus our work this afternoon. Um, so let's, um, now in page 11, right, so we're looking at the definition of uh, fascination. And I want to, we're not going to like read the entire thing, but let me highlight two main ideas that you're going to find here in this text that I think are worthwhile to uh, talk about. Um, so when we talk about fascination, right, is this a state of delusion created? Um, so we lose a little bit of our capacity of judge things. One thing that is important, um, you know, who, who, who becomes fascinated, right? And so maybe it is our idea that someone who doesn't know spiritualism very well becomes fascinated, but actually um, we who know very well <laughs> we are usually the main source for um, fascination, okay? So on the very um, last sentence of the first paragraph, those who think that this type of obsession can only touch simple, ignorant, and senseless persons are mistaken. The most refined, educated, and otherwise intelligent individuals are not at all exempt from this kind of delusion. So, it could happen to any of us because this room is made of refined, educated, and intelligent individuals. So, uh, us. Now, um, on the second paragraph, um, there is another thing that I think is important in the identification of um, fascination. So, when someone becomes fascinated under the process of fascination, right? This person, um, the spirits who are fascinating, dread more than anything else, person who sees things clearly. Their tactic is nearly always that of inspiring the mediums to avoid whoever might open their eyes. Thus, by avoiding any contradiction, they are always certain to be in the right. So, what this means is, when someone is being fascinated, that person is going to be um, led to move away from anyone or any person who has anything that could remotely open their eyes to the fact that they are fascinated. So what does that mean to us? Uh, it means if we're running away from people who have something to tell us that we don't like to hear necessarily, uh, watch out, bad sign. Okay, who likes to be criticized? Please raise your hand. <laughs> Only my friend Kevin Cohn. But us is spirit because he's much more evolved than us because he's not a spiritist. But we who are a spiritist, we, let me be very honest with you, we hate to be criticized. That is the truth. That is the truth. Because anytime we criticize, we feel so, so incredibly bad about ourselves. The level of shame, whether we identify that or not, is so deep in us. The sense, the sense of, um, you know, uh, low self-esteem is so high in us still. The criticism is one of the hardest, hardest things for us to deal with. And so, the defense mechanism that we come up with is Rage, irritation, aggressiveness, dislike. We can't bear criticism. Okay? So, as difficult as it, this may be, and believe me, it's very difficult because no matter how much we know about spiritism, emotionally speaking, we are very, very much like children. Very much. So it's time where we need to make an effort to grow up, no matter how hard that is. And um, one of the things that you're gonna hear me saying today is be mindful of your feelings, because quite honestly, 
it's very utopic at this point to say that when someone criticizes me, I'm not going to be ir irritated. Yes, I will be irritated. I do not want to hear that. But there's no problem with being irritated. What I need to do is to go home mindful of my own feelings. One of the biggest problems in spiritism is that we find some uh, uh, people who say, well, I'm, I'm really mad anyway, and I don't care. That's just how I am. Yeah, this, all these charity and forgiveness is for everybody else, not for me. Or some people who are going to say, I'm never irritated. The person is clearly irritated, but a lot of us who grew up in spiritualism, like myself, for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, anger, it was a prohibited feeling. And spirits don't get angry. Right? But yes, we do get angry because anger is a very normal feeling. And there's nothing wrong with being angry. The problem is what you do with your anger. Right? So if you're irritated, go home. Right? I usually lose my nights of sleep. And I'm in a very bad mood the next day. But that stays with me. I'm very mindful of my irritation, and that gives you a tremendous chance of do some work. Okay? And so, um, the point that I'm trying to do, not kind of going too far away, is that we need to try to tolerate listening. If we're running away from people who are telling us something different, be careful. Be careful because that is one of the tactics that the spirits will use, is try to isolate us and move us away from any person who might have something irritating but important to tell us about ourselves. All right, so with that in mind, uh, we're gonna move to uh, page 12, which is Obsession in the Spiritist Movement. Um, how much time do I have so I can try to finish this? 45, 45 minutes. Okay. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes. And here's what we have. Um, one, two, three. Okay. So you can like do twos or threes or fours. I don't care how you do this. But until this um, lady, you, I can't read your name. I'm a little Janet. blind. Huh? Janet. Janet, okay. This is group one. And then the middle people here, uh, including Marcelo, Kirsten, and Bob, okay? You guys are number two. You don't need to get together. You're just going to be looking at number two. And then Fernando, yes, and that way you guys are number three. So you have three texts that you're going to look at. First one is group one, it's called Program Infiltration. And I'm just going to do this so to give an example on how you can run these at our centers, okay? So you guys will be Program Infiltration. So you're going to read that first text there. And what you need to do for me is summarize, um, it's there. Uh, describe the tactics of the inferior spirits to impose the obsessive process. Identify the feelings that make the group prone to obsession, uh, discuss the concepts of professional spiritists, and suggest an antidote uh, for obsession. There's no D there on that antidote, right? Group two, right here in the middle, is gonna read the uh, text, um, fascination text one on page 13, and um, is gonna discuss the spirit's tactics in promoting fascination identify the steps of the process, and then I have a quote by the medium's book that you have to correlate with this uh, particular text. And the folks here on number three are gonna read the second text about fascination, and identify the expressions, the way in which the fascination um, expresses itself in the spiritist movement, and identify also the feelings in the process, um, and discuss how these ideas and information mean to us in our daily lives in the spiritual center. Okay, so you have 10 minutes to do that, and then uh, just do the best you can, um, and then we'll discuss together in the group. Okay, and you can talk to each other, you can do in twos and threes, like I said, any way you want.
Yeah. And every time she says this word, it gets me. Yeah. 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 So I don't listen to anything else she says. Yeah. That one word. Yeah. Gone now. Okay, guys, you got a minute. All right, my dear friends, I'm sure you have not finished. 
But that's okay, we'll finish together in the big group. So, um, I only have 35 minutes and three hours of workshop to talk. So, turn around, please. I love to see your enthusiasm. You don't want to stop talking, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do about group one. <laughs> Okay, uh, Marcelo is telling me there's some mistakes on the... And I'm sure there, there are plenty of mistakes. Actually, let me just say something that I should have said in the very beginning. Um, for, the, for, for some of you who know how my life is, uh, I put this together like I don't even know how, tell you the truth. So, um, and a lot of the stuff I translated myself. So, you know, uh, please help me identifying what's wrong and it is... One million revisions probably um, is, I mean, definitely uh, needs a lot of work, okay? I just did my best to put it together for today. Um, so let's go. Group one, just tell us, I mean, in a, let's try to really, really summarize. What is your text about? Who's going to talk? I'll do it. I want to elaborate. Come over here, please. So that we can have it on the mic. <laughs> All right, guys, here we go. This paragraph is from the point of view of an obsessor, and the intent is to sow discord amongst a group of spiritists by exploiting everyday weaknesses that we all have. Examples could be irritation, jealousy, gossip, indignation, that sort of thing. But it also mentions economic, so social, and political difficulties. So, for instance, the problems in the recent, you know, problems with our economy, that can bring out a lot of bad feelings that people have. Well, obsessors can exploit those bad feelings. Oh, this is all the fault of such and such, and you start wanting to blame groups and that kind of thing. But it also can be connected to the family. Uh, everyday tensions that occur within families can be an opportunity for obsessors to try and exploit. This first text is from the book um, Aconteceu na Casa Espírita, right? It happened at the Spiritual Center. Um, so, very well said. I just want to um, reiterate the, uh, the feelings of irritation, jealousy, gossip, indignation, resentments, and dispute of positions, functions, and tasks as one of the uh, major gaps for the obsession process to uh, be installed. Um, resentment is a tough one. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I wish we had more time for this, but um, some people say, well, I don't carry any resentment in my heart. And then you were in a, uh, in a, in a situation with a group of people and someone makes a sarcastic comment. And that sarcastic comment is from something that happened a long, long time ago. <laughs> Hello, flag, okay? Sarcasm a lot of times is the expression of feelings that were never ever resolved, okay? Or if we keep bringing things up that happened six months ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, hello, it was not resolved, okay? So that means please keep working on it. Be aware that's not resolved because anything and everything that's not resolved within the group becomes a, a door, a, a window and a gap where the spirits can nourish those feelings in us and potentialize those feelings and, you know, problems can happen. So group one, terrific job. Group two. Kirsten. Kirsten. Okay, come here, please. 30 seconds. You got 30 seconds. <laughs> 22. Okay, so our job was to discuss the spirit's tactics in promoting fascination, um, identifying the process, and correlating a text we had to read um, along with um, description of fascination and how basically the lower or the less evolved spirits wish to um, basically divide and conquer. So we sort of talked about that, but that's sort of their tactic. And we talked about it as a group in terms of 
working on ourselves and being more mindful, as Susanna was saying about watching our own emotions and discussing them. And, and really, I think one other thing we were going to say before we had to end was that what Kardec recommended is that when we feel like we have a problem with someone, instead of going and talking to somebody else about it, go directly to the person. You know, adult to adult, and just say, hey, I feel something, what's going on? I mean, honestly. So, and then he gives other recommendations too, because it's only 30 seconds, that's what I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it was great, thank you. Yes, those are tags actually from Alain Kardec in the Spiritist magazine of uh, 1859. So where he talks about the disunion in the spiritist movement way back then. So um, it's an ongoing problem along Kardec, wherever you are. So, right? <laughs> okay, so, and um, again, one of the, t the tactics of the spirits is disunion. Try to bring us together. And um, again, one of the things that they will do is, so when we become like suspicious, a lot suspicious of a lot of people, and we isolate ourselves, now, um, this isolation is, not, is never absolute, okay? Because we're always going to have some people who are, you know, in line with our thoughts. And those folks will usually surround us with a lot of flattery, okay? And so, yes, you were right, yes, you know. And so what happens is, and I see a lot of people shaking their heads, I hope you think of yourselves and not of somebody else. Remember that that's the purpose of the <laughs> workshop. As I'm talking about those things, let's think of ourselves, okay? Because we probably have been there somewhat to some extent, right? And so, remember, um, flattery is very, very dangerous, okay? Um, which does not mean that we're not going to say to Judo after his lecture, good job, I really like your job. You know, I really like what you did, the work was very well, you know. This is different than saying, Judo, you are a top star, you know, man? You rock, right? So, I mean, there are ways in which we can compliment people, but we should not idealize people. We should not, you know, because we are so frail, and that becomes um, very dangerous. So, um, all right, very good. Let's go to group three. Who is going to speak? Come on, guys, you got 30 seconds, now 29. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So, our task was to identify the expressions of fascination brought us in the spiritist movement. And then uh, we co correlated with uh, one text here that Mino you know, has a, book, uh, a couple of things here in bold to help us as well. And uh, when we were discussing, we were thinking, okay, uh, how can the spirits start bringing uh, fascination, how can some of those ex expressions, it's easy to identify, it's, for instance, people that come with new tech, like new ways of doing things, even going against the spiritism on the basic of the codification. No, actually, you know what, this is old school, this is how you do that today, this is how I used to do that in my country and bring it here. Your passes are not strong enough, we have a new way to do passes, look how I do it. Or even people that come with things that are completely different and some other people may get fascinated by that. Say, you know what? You are the one that we were expecting. We wouldn't bring any union to the spiritist group or we would just break everything down. That's what we were discussing. So I guess I got my 30 seconds. Great, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's precisely what this um, text uh, speaks about. And it's from uh, the book of my essays in Um and uh, the, other, the other way in which sometimes um, uh, the fascination process will manifest itself is some people become missionaries in the spiritual movement, okay? They take for the, for the, upon themselves the role of saving the spiritual movement, okay? Um, saving all of us. <laughs> and, um, and that's... Um, you know, and it's literally uh, written here. New missionaries appear from one moment to the other, achieving themselves superior accomplishments. Okay, so very, very dangerous road. Oh, let me go. I need to go, you know, because this group is lost and I have the salvation and I'm going to go help them because they need of help. And you are who again? All right. So, um, 
If Minnie Gimaga guys actually, I read that on Facebook, you know, for the ones who don't like Facebook, there's some good stuff on Facebook, and uh, Sabrina from Orlando the posted on Facebook um, this week, um, a posting from Herculano Pigis where she says that, well, not she, the Herculano Pigis said that uh, in spiritism, there are no shepherds in sheep, that um, the work, there's only work to be done by all of us, and affinities to be established among friends in equal conditions. So we should be reaching out to each other in equal condition. And if someone is taking a stance of missionaries, I think that's something for us to be attentive to, because according to the spirits, that's one of the ways in which manifest, uh, fascination can manifest itself. All right, so now let's look at the role of spiritists and um, obsession. And again, this was meant to be a group uh, work, but we're not going to have time, so I'm going to cover with you, okay? So we're going to look at the first um, text, and now I am in page uh, 15. And what we'll do is um, we'll all read together. So um, do you mind studying for us? Uh, yes? You and me? Yes? My dear friend, all you need to do is to read. The incarnate friends often forget that both worlds, physical and spiritual, interpenetrate themselves without clear frontiers, which allows for a constant interchange among its inhabitants. None within matter, even though one regarding the need for watchfulness, they are easily taken by aggressive attitudes and by daily behavior that is totally diverse from the one they should experience, opening the doors to psychic connection with unhappy spirits, yielding to their interfer interference, in un interference in unfortunate obsessive processes. Excellent theorists and observers of what goes on around them in regards to matter, matters that go against their interests they are easily taken by resentment, by rage, that is transformed in cholera, intoxicating their beings and becoming easy prey to the manipulation of the ones to whom they should be offering resistance through dignifying actions. Pride, the spurious child of selfishness, is the biggest adversary of human beings who consider themselves special and always deserving of respect and consideration, even though they do not offer either respect or consideration to the ones they call enemies. Unreasonable and immature, they create situations of difficult solutions by the way they deal with the issues, issues that should be resolved through fraternal understanding and sincere friendships. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, so let's go back here a little bit and start identifying some of the feelings again. And um, as I go to them, the, um, what I'm proposing is for us to think about ourselves and if we have experienced any of those feelings, uh, such as aggressiveness, having been aggressive with one another. That does, mean, does not mean that we hit someone, but have we spoken harshly, for example? Okay? Uh, have we thought harshly? Because sometimes we don't say, but we think, right? Um, are we, where, where is our primary focus? Is it in our own behavior, in our own thoughts or feelings, or are we excellent theorists? and observers of what goes around us. Um, how about resentment? I mean, how much resentment do we have in our hearts these days? Have we experienced rage, cholera? So those are the feelings that are um, highlighted here in the text. Now, uh, one, two, three, fourth paragraph, uh, pride, 
talks about fry. You see a little star there. Um, sometimes I, um, if you go to the, the other page, you're going to find a little bit of a definition from Joana de Angeli, so I added that to the text, okay? Um, so, um, talks here, pride is pure child of selfishness, the biggest adversary of human beings who consider themselves special and always deserving of respect and consideration. We, we really think that we are very special, right? Okay, let me tell you a very, very human moment of mine, okay? Now, people who see me talking know that once in a while I disclose something very intimate about myself. And it's not that I want to bring it to myself and, you know, when I'm telling the people who are going to speak at the, the center, don't talk about yourself, it's not about yourself. But when we are doing relational work, I really like to use my own struggles and my own difficulties to say, here, this is what it looks like, okay? So, um, I am invited to talk at different um, seminars and some of them I have been invited for several years in a row. And then one day I'm not invited and I'm like, hmm, <laughs> why they didn't invite me? Now this year instead of inviting me, they invited Julio. Oh. <laughs> And I'm talking like this, it sounds like a joke, right? But this is serious stuff. And this is so common because it means like, you know, we want to be seen, we want to be important, we want people to remember of us, we want people to really like the things that we do, right? And then, and then what, right? And then what are we gonna do? Let me call Marcia. Marcia, I know that the conference is coming. Can you please schedule me? I would love to go. And my, and my, and my um, excuse is like, oh, I love to work. I want to cooperate. You know, I want to give you my contribution, right? Please put me on the agenda. Really? I mean, and I felt that. I have felt that. Seriously, I have. And when I feel that, okay, so why am I feeling this way? Because in one of the messages that we read here, there's so much work and so much need everywhere. You know what I mean? And the people who organize the events, and I organize some events, sometimes we choose the people based on the needs of the work, based on the needs of, you know, whatever. There, there's so many different, sometimes you want to bring different speakers because to, Different people have different contributions. So there are many, many different reasons. And we shouldn't feel, but you know, we feel like less. We want people to be inviting me. Let me talk about myself, because you may not relate to this. So I want to be, you know, be invited because, well, people think that I'm good, think that I'm doing good. But you know what? There's a lot of work to do at the Conscious Living Spiritual Group back in North Miami. You know, there's a lot of work to be done everywhere. So this is just like one um, a small example. And so there are many other situations in the spiritual movement that we should pay attention to. Why are we heard? What are our intentions, true intentions? What are we looking for? Um, so that we become, you know, together as a group, as friends, you know, we can start closing these gaps. Because again, I think we are losing some important fights here with um, our, you know, brothers who don't want to see us succeeding, you know. And, you know, I was talking to Julio while you guys were reading, you know, let's not one more time fail. Let's not one more time cross to the next side and get over there and think, oh my God, you know, we let all those little insignificant differences separate us one more time. And we failed again. You know, it's a big, big responsibility and each one of us should leave here today thinking, you know, what, how, how am I doing? You know, when I pass, which, you know, some of our past in 40 years, what if it's tomorrow? I know that this is freaky, but what is tomorrow? What, is, what situation is it going to get over there? What, what do you have to say? 
when the Dr. Bezerra, Dr. Bezerra Jimenez comes to vi visit you. Oh, wow. He's, yeah. I'm going to be so happy. You'll be so happy. And he's going to ask you, Sandra, what have you done to help my cause of the unification movement? You know, how many people you forgave? You know, how many doors you opened? And what we have to say? So anyway, um, so let's just try to finish this. Uh, go ahead. Yes, please, very loud. Uh, first of all, I love what's going on in here because I always thought this is the sort of work that we should be doing in a seminar for experiences. Excellent work, my friend. Me too. Uh, we were in Cuba last year, and I learned such a powerful lesson. And the lesson did not, came, did not come from the speakers. You know, I've watched all the videos from previous years, and Raul Teixeira, which I consider uh, one of my teachers, uh, he gave great lectures all these years. And at the end of the lecture, you see the entire crowd standing up and giving him a standing ovation for his excellent lecture. And unfortunately, last year, because he had the accident, uh, he couldn't go. And uh, the most powerful lesson that I learned in, in that symposium is the fact that his name was not even mentioned. Which means, don't you ever work for people applause. But because if you do, you're gonna get very disappointed. People might applaud you and they will forget. You applaud, you, you work, uh, always thinking that you have given your best because you're always receiving the best. I, I know what you're doing. There is no addition to that. But since you have the courage to give your statements, I wanted to add this as Thank you for the <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. All right, so where did we stop? Um, Carrie, right? Okay, so let me just take it from here just because of the time. We have 15 minutes, so I'm going to finish reading this text and try to close it. So, carrying a morbid sensitivity, they keep resentments and vociferate when annoyed and upset, opening vibratory fields to the interference of vicious and disturbed minds. These minds associate themselves to these brothers and sisters who will assume unfortunate postures against their neighbors, who they should love and understand, compromising the work where they find themselves. Many noble institutions on earth with elevated objectives in the construction of a better world are weakened due to this unfortunate commerce with the vengeful spirits, compromising the entire effort of a group constituted of benefactors and the dedicated workers utilized by them. While the workers remain destitute of the responsibility to leave the message of the gospel, able to surpass selfishness and the need of the projection of one's image, the enormous battle will continue. And that's the end of this uh, passage. So let me just point out when he says, carrying a morbid sensitivity. We are so sensitive indeed, no? It takes very, very little to hurt us. So just something to um, to think about. Um, let's just finish reading here B and C. So on B, adopting ridiculous attitudes of revenge and suspiciousness in regard to their brothers of faith and friends in the spiritual activities, many brothers and sisters become a tripping stone to all after being poisoned with the sick mental fixations that they embrace whenever disappointed or unhappy. It is natural that many of the adherents of the message feel enthusiasm and work diligently to its dissemination in the manifestation of the new free ideas. However, as it is understandable, the challenges mix with the personal problems arise, weakening the joy. As a result, negative observations about the neighbors appear, contrariety arises when one's suggestions and directives are not necessarily accepted, often inspired by the discarded enemies of the ideal, leading to the appearance of parties, dissensions, and desertion. So, I would like to highlight disappointment and also um, what the text says about when we suggest something or give a directive that's not necessarily accepted by the group, the levels of, um, com you know, the feelings that arise from our ideas. We who have great, brilliant, 
and probably the best ideas in the world when not accepted by someone, <laughs> right? How do we feel and what happens uh, with that? And it's here, often inspired by the discarded enemies of the ideal, leading to the appearance of the dissensions and um, desertion. Okay, so um, let me just tell you what else is in here um, before we close. Um, the next uh, text here that you have on page uh, 17, it's, um, you know, it will, talk, it will touch other feelings. Um, it talks about uh, the concept of mental gaps, brings the idea of self-sufficiency. Some people, you know, they, oh, I don't need anybody else. You know, I can do this by myself. Red flag. We need people. We need each person's talent, you know. Um, yeah, you might be able to do that by yourself, but you're placing yourself in a very vulnerable position, and the work probably would have been much richer and much nicer if you had brought the different talents that each group and each individual can add to the work. Um, let's move on. Uh, on page 18, you have a case um, I leave to hear a few in the book, in the book um, Obsession in the Spirit's Movement, if I'm not mistaken, is the title, yeah? Okay, so he talks about uh, these four characteristics, for lack of a better word in my mind right now, um, that we present that become, um, you know, uh, areas of vulnerable, vulnerable areas for obsession. Um, sex, money, power, and, um, and vanity. Um, so, I chose this case, the case of Leoncio, because it talks about um, someone who was fascinated, so it goes along with the, um, the study that we are doing, right? And he has um, precisely this idea that he had a mission, a mission of defending along Kardec, okay, uh, the mission of um, preserving the memory of the master of Lyon, uh, fighting against um, everyone, and it talks about here that he took this to the extreme where he, st he started to attack systematically respectable names and venerable institutions in the movement. So you get to a point where you become so fascinated with your own ideas he took the mission and he started not only talking about badly about people close to you, but now attacking institutions, venerable institutions in the movement, um, flags. I mean, I could talk more about that, but I really don't think I need, because I think it's pretty clear, nor I have time. Um, and then after the case, what you're gonna have is precisely um, there's actually a question uh, that Andrew Lewis asked his mentor is, which is on page 19 in the box. He says, I would like to understand how could our friend Leoncio, who was a spiritist with all his knowledge, so many resources, become involved in this harmful web? So when you think to that group, you can get the group to try to answer it and see what the group would come up with, okay? And then there is an analysis done by a, uh, uh, Dr. Luis Sanquerafilio on why he thinks that happens. And on page 20, you're gonna find this question, what went wrong? And this is the summary that I did to the question given by the mentor at the book. Okay, so I'm reading you by the... Um, on page 20, you're gonna see consider, these are just like some ideas to consider in face of this case. All right, the last part of this uh, book is called Healing from Obsession. So um, I just want to, I would like to read uh, the second paragraph, uh, which is the biggest one. It says, Spiritism has to undergo tough tests, and it is through this test that God will recognize its true servants by their courage, firmness, and perseverance. The ones who are disturbed by fear or are discouraged by a frustration are like some soldiers, they're only courageous in times of peace and who withdraw at the first shot. However, the biggest trial will not be the persecution that the doctrine will suffer. 
It will be the conflict of ideas that will rise. The enemies will count on the assistance of the conflicts to break the workers apart in the unity found in the spiritual doctrine. So very, very important um, warning by uh, Alain Kardec back then in 1865. If you turn to page 22, there's some questions for the group to answer. There's a plan of action that has four parts. Know thyself, understand your central desire. This is a text from the book, from the book, Andrew Lewis, Mediumship, yeah. Action and Reaction. No, the Mediumship, in the realms of Mediumship, okay? It's one of, I think, one of the best, best paragraphs in Andrew Lewis that talks about obsession. He explained, actually, is an explanation given by the obsessors to Andrew Lewis on how they promote the obsessive, obsessive process. And so they will talk about the central desire. Each one of us has a central desire. Each one of us has a central theme, an area of vulnerability. So this text is there for you to read, to review, to study, and the exercise is, you know, do you know what your central desire is? Do you know where, what? It's not an action and reaction. I, I, don't, I don't think so, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, and if I am, we can uh, certainly correct. Um, it might be, it might be. I wrote action and reaction? You did. I might, I might be right. <laughs> when I wrote it, so right now I'm a little tired, so it might be that that day I was right and today I'm wrong. All right, action reaction. So, so that would be the first part of the plan of action, right? Is understanding your central desire and what is that drives you. Then uh, there is this um, uh, question of the spirit's book, and that's page 23 that talks about what's the most meritorious of all virtues, and it's right there. The highest virtue consists in the sacrifice of self-interest. The highest virtue is the sacrifice of self-interest. It's putting your interest aside so that the interest of the group can prevail. Um, and I also love the other uh, question, 917. Um, what is the means to destroy selfishness? If you Flip to page 24, um, the third sentence says, selfishness is founded upon the importance of the personality. I, I talk about this sometimes in my lectures. We, we really um, consider ourselves very important. So um, I usually say like this, if you are, um, someone does something to you, you would say something like this, I really don't understand how this person had the courage to do this. To me. So the point is not that the person did something out of line. The point is the person did that to me. So these are ways in which we identify two minutes. I'm flipping the page to 25. Okay, and here we have a closing message that's actually found, found in the book, uh, Living Spring, recently um, uh, translated. Okay, I love this message. I chose this message because there is called Fraternal Union, and you can read the, the message, um, but it, you know, it talks about how we would like for all other roads to be subordinated to ours. And that for us, the idea of union is that. Let's unify the spirits movement, everybody. We're gonna leave this room unified. Do me a favor, think like me. And we all gonna be unified. <laughs> and so, that's the solution. And that's precisely what Emmanuel talks about here. You would probably like for all the roads to be subordinated to yours, and you see unit as being all travelers gravitating around your steps, right? So, but what he's going to say, or look what Emmanuel says, but join others without expecting them to join you. Okay, very difficult for us, right? So, um, read this message, think about it, it's a beautiful, beautiful 
at the very end of the message, this third argument is a result of imposition. When we enter in an argument and we keep arguing, 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 it's because we are trying to impose our ideas. Okay? And finally, at the very end, you're going to find a plan of action. Um, and I have some items there for you. So identify your feelings. Consider that you are possibly an instrument of the inferior spirits. What can you change? Do not place yourself above others. Remember, no one is self-sufficient. Seek help. Seek other groups. Talk to other people. Don't work in isolation in your spiritual center. Go see what people are doing. You know, consider different options. Open your doors. Bring people from other centers. Visit other centers. Do not expect privileges. Well, I hope that when I come to Chicago, they go pick me up at the airport because after all, I'm Dr. Susanna Simões. <laughs> and so if there's not a person waiting for me with my name, I'm not coming to Chicago anymore. Come on, take your cab, go, you know, do your thing, you know. In your Majesty, you know, we, Majesty's in England. This is America, we're Chicago. Take your cab, you know, do your part, help in any way you can. We're not that special. And um, be mindful. Be mindful of your feelings. You're not going to be able to avoid them. But, you know, let me tell you something. If someone tells you you're irritated and you say, no, I'm not, but your heart rate is up, the answer is, yes, you are. Okay? So your physiological response speaks about your emotional status. Oh, my heart rate's going up. Oh, my hands are sweating. Something's going on. You are having a defensive reaction. Be mindful of it. It's okay. You know, we are instinctive beings, so we are going to react. I know he's looking for me 30 seconds, okay? So, um, you know, do the exercise of sacrificing your point of view. Uh, make yourself constantly available to goodness. I like this one, I'm not gonna comment on it, but that's a, a mantra of mine. Do not place institutions and rules above charity and love. Cultivate curiosity. We differ. Be curious about the other person's point of view. Mm -hmm. Be curious. Why do you think this way? Where are you coming from? Because curiosity opened the doors for dialogue. And final words by Kardec. Let's oppose the inferior spirits with a wall of charity, of mutual benevolence, and we'll be invulnerable against the malign influence. Sorry for running so much. Thank you very much.